Thanks, Dr. Yamaguchi. I'd like to thank Dr. Fries for uh, inviting a neonatologist. I think Dr. Snyder is the only other neonatologist here at uh, Sanford Burnham. And uh, for those of us who take care of babies, we live in an environment of rare diseases. Back in the nursery in St. Louis today, there are the 75 children in the uh, unit. There probably are at least 60 of them who have rare diseases. So while these diseases are maybe individually rare, to me, they're collectively quite common. Um, so, whoops. So let, first of all, let me say that I had no disclosures, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, the uh, uh, support of uh, of uh, the NIH. And I'm going to tell you uh, stories today about two teams. One is Team Savannah, and one is Team Sophie, Evelyn, and Isabella. And these two teams came together with quite different expertises from very different points of view, both clinically and scientifically. And the teams came together to answer the question from each set of parents, which is, why has my baby turned out this way? Okay, so here are some of the team members. Uh, on the left is uh, Todd Drewley. He's an assistant professor of pediatrics. Uh, in the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology, and he has become very interested in the genomics of uh, childhood cancer. Uh, Dan Wegner is the lab manager in our laboratory, and uh, Dan has forgotten more about genomics and computational genomics than I probably ever knew. Um, uh, Team Savannah uh, thought that it was dealing with a congenital disorder of glycosylation, and so turned to Stuart Kornfeld, who's a well-known uh, CDG expert and a postdoctoral member of uh, his laboratory, Helena Van Meel, to try to help us, and you'll see some information from them. And then uh, Team Sophie, Isabella, and uh, Evelyn uh, ran into an issue with uh, a, a possible discovery that um, uh, uh, we, there was no human phenotype for. And so we searched around and found uh, Dr. Parmachek and John Lee, who is a senior research scientist at this laboratory, who have spent the last decade or so um, uh, thinking about this particular gene. So these two teams, I hope, will provide you a little bit more of a tangible uh, example, examples of what Eric Green was talking about uh, this morning. Oh, there's my disclosure slide, okay. So, as Eric said this morning, one of the problems that we have uh, in exome, one of the advantages that we have in exome sequencing is that we can catalog almost comprehensively every genomic variant in individual genomes, which is terrific, terrific. But uh, as indicated by this table taken from a Mike Bamshad review, uh, recent review, what uh, Mike did was he looked at the mean number of variants in African descent and European descent individuals per individual genome. So this just gives you a sense of how many variants there are in an average genome. So let's first of all look at novel variants. So these are variants that are not in uh, DBSNP-131 and not in 200 control exomes. And so that every one of us carries around 520, if you're African descent, or about 300, if you're European descent, novel variants. And the reason we're interested in novel variants is because rare Mendelian phenotypes are likely to be novel or rare because, at least from a childhood or nursery point of view, the phenotypes are generally not compatible with reproduction. And so the phenotypes reduce reproductive fitness, and therefore there is significant selective pressure against these variants becoming common in the population. So novel variants are fairly common in individuals, but look at the non-novel variants, 20 plus uh, 20,000. So the total number of variants in each genome is around 20,000. So the computational problem, now that we have next generation sequencing, which can resolve these variants, is how do you find in a, an individual with a rare, possible rare Mendelian phenotype, 
how do you find the variants that, are, that account for the disease? So um, there, uh, we'll, we're going to start with uh, just giving you a quick background about what we did to find this, or what Todd and Dan did to find these needles in the haystack. The first is we did this sort of routine thing. We counted the, we counted the chromosomes and made sure there were, you know, 46 chromosomes and there weren't any big uh, rearrangements, translocations, et cetera. We also did look for copy number variants with a, a, a genome-wide array. We assumed that these two children, that, or these four children that we are about to discuss, had um, uh, an, uh, a recessively inherited phenotype and that they had inherited it from their parents. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but those were the sort of initial assumptions because you have to try to start somewhere to figure out what's uh, going on. Um, we used uh, an exome sequencing um, strategy. This is, again, as Dr. Green said, I'm not endorsing this strategy, but this is one of the many uh, sort of uh, ways of capturing uh, uh, exomes in humans. Uh, and we used uh, an Illumina HiSeq platform. We, uh, one of the issues that one has, so now that one has the sequence, an exome sequence of an individual, how do you know what the sequence where the sequence is, and so there has to be an alignment strategy for, um, for exome sequencing. Um, we used, uh, again, this is a rapidly evolve evolving computational area, but we used a relatively new standard uh, uh, method, computational method, to ident identify single nucleotide variants. And then we made sure that all the variants that we looked at were real as best as we could tell from next generation sequencing based on the number of times that each variant was sequenced. And 5x is pretty low. And the reason we use such a low uh, coverage criterion is because we didn't want to miss a rare variant. Okay? And also on the quality of uh, the sequencing. And then we uh, made a preliminary assessment of the sensitivity of next-gen sequencing by basically comparing the genome array and the exome sequencing. So we looked at the spots in the, uh, in the genome array uh, and the, uh, that matched the spots in the exome array, and we found a very close uh, correlation at about 2,500 uh, positions. So this is what we did for each of the families, each of the teams, at the beginning of our, uh, of our uh, story here. So here, then, it's where we diverge a little bit. So we're going to talk about now about Team Savannah. So Team Savannah is uh, a little girl who uh, had multi-organ failure. This is the couple's first baby. B both mom and dad were completely healthy. And I actually saw the baby at about four weeks of age. Uh, she was born at 35 weeks, about five weeks early, for maternal indications. Uh, mom's first child, she was trying to breastfeed, and she wasn't gaining weight. And so she was admitted to the hospital because she wasn't gaining weight. And I went, you know, the screening laboratories were all pretty normal, and uh, the baby was sort of waking up and looking at you, and mother was clearly very um, concerned about her ability to breastfeed. And so um, I tried to reassure the mom that uh, everything was going to be fine, that we tried to give her some new strategies for breastfeeding, um, and uh, we said, you know, I think everything, I said, I think everything is going to be okay. Uh, I was wrong. Um, over the next roughly 14 months, uh, she spent about 10 months in the hospital. Uh, she had liver failure, she had transfusion dependent red cell aplasia, renal tubular dysfunction, interstitial lung disease, she was hypotonic, and she had central hypothyroidism. We initially thought uh, that she had a congenital disorder of glycosylation based on her transferrin glycosylation patterns. I think retrospectively, that was probably more attributable to her liver failure than it was actually to her CDG, but we, uh, that's one of the reasons why we engaged uh, Dr. Uh, Kornfeld in trying to uh, think about this. And so in an effort, uh, there was a, there were, this constellation of symptoms uh, was reviewed by a considerable array, parade, of pediatric subspecialists. And each of them at the end of the day would say, well, she doesn't exactly fit this, she doesn't exactly fit that. And uh, we ended up having continually to say to her parents, well, we think that your baby has a big problem and we think it's an accident of nature, which is fine, 
but it doesn't give the parents any understanding of what the problem is, and more importantly, it doesn't give any direction in terms of potential uh, therapeutic intervention. And so we proposed to the parents, and this was now about uh, 14 or 16 months ago, right after the first uh, exome sequencing results came out. I'm sure you're familiar about, there were now about two or three dozen of these exome sequencing results of trios, mother, father, and affected child, um, where one uh, uh, sequences the exomes in all three individuals and then computationally filters that so that we can try to identify the variants in a gene uh, or relatively small number of genes that are responsible for the, for the affected person's problem. And so for this particular child, we uh, elected to use the following filters. Now, filtering exome sequencing data is sort of an art still. It's not exactly a science yet. And it has to be, to some extent, informed by what you think the biology of the problem is with which you're dealing. But in any event, we elected, or Dan elected, to filter, first of all, uh, and identified and pull out of the exome data from the mother, the father, and the affected baby, uh, those single nucleotide variants that were thought to be functional by, a, by two um, software algorithms that use conservation and how this, how this particular SNP might affect uh, protein function in other proteins. Um, uh, and clearly they were all non-synonymous. And we also decided that since this baby's uh, phenotype was so unusual, it was very unlikely that her specific genetic variants had been recognized previously. And so what we said was, any SNP or single nucleotide variant that we can find in 1,000 genomes or the exome sequencing project, which is another NHGRI, NHLBI um, supported uh, uh, initiative, we're going to exclude because we don't want to see SNPs that somebody else has already reported because we don't think that uh, they could possibly be involved in this child's uh, problem. Then we selected um, gene loci in the child that had at least two disruptive SNPs that were not seen anyplace else in uh, these other big databases and for which there was a SNP on one allele of each parent, okay? And when you do that, I mean, we could, uh, now, uh, I'm now, I'm now summarizing a large number of hours of days, weeks of work here because we did run down a few wrong trails with wrong assumptions. But the bottom line is when you apply these filters, a single gene appears to be accountable for this child's disease. And it's a gene called methionyl amino acid tRNA synthetase, or the MARS gene. And it appears that uh, it appeared that the child had inherited uh, two missense mutations, one from the dad and a different one from the mom. And so we ran to the literature and said, and we asked Dr. Kornfeld, does this make sense? And fortunately, Dr. Eric Green had reviewed this area uh, in 2008. And uh, at that time, there was a limited number of tRNA synthetase genes that had been associated with human disease, most of them associated with neurodegenerative disease called Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease, okay? There have been a couple of other, since this uh, review was done, there have been a couple of other tRNA synthetase associated uh, diseases reported, but they're actually mitochondrial diseases, and they're also uh, myopathic diseases, and none of the reported diseases appeared to have the sort of more global uh, constellation of problems that this child had, and you'll notice there were no other MARS-associated human diseases. None. None that we could find. So what does MARS do? This is again taken from Dr. Green's uh, review in 2008, and let me what, what, what this enzyme does that's encoded by this gene is that it basically adds methionine, a required or an important amino acid, to a, a molecule called tRNA, which then attaches that amino acid to other amino acids to make proteins. So it's a pretty important, a pretty important uh, enzyme, and it does that in two steps. The first step is a step where 
Here is the uh, amino acid, and it's an ATP-dependent step that requires, basically charges or attaches the amino acid to the tRNA synthetase. And then the second step really is the transfer of the amino acid group to the tRNA, which is uh, not, uh, uh, not uh, w which is the second step. Let me direct your attention to this step. This is a this is a step uh, that the tRNA synthetase uh, does, does in, um, uh, that uh, we thought was disrupted. Here is a schematic of the uh, tRNA synthetase, and the two um, mutations happen to uh, reside in the catalytic domain or the domain which is responsible for activating the methionyl amino acid. And so, um, uh, Helena and uh, Stuart reasoned that there may be a way of testing whether or not this particular um, uh, Mars synthetase gene is actually, uh, is actually uh, dysfunctional in this particular patient. And so uh, uh, Helena did the following first experiment. First, she took the uh, con she took control fibroblasts and she took the patients, the baby's fibroblasts, and she tried to immunoprecipitate the, the, the uh, gene product from the Mars gene. Here it is right here. As you can see, unlike other genetic defects where no protein is made or a protein of abnormal weight is made, this uh, experiment appears to show that the patient and the control make the protein. Okay, so then... The next thing that uh, Helena did was she said, well, maybe we can, work out, we can work out an assay. Let's see if I can transfect into another cell type, HEK293 cells, the wild type Mars, the uh, one dysfunctional allele and a second dysfunctional allele, and let's see if I can get them expressed in this surrogate cell system. And as you can see, she could get wild type and both mutations expressed in HEK293 cells. So that gave then Helena and Stuart the possibility of being able to set up an assay. And so here is the assay that they set up. They basically took the transfected HEK293 cell lysate, and they said, is there Mars activity in that lysate? And so what they did was, remember, what, the Mar what Mars does is it attaches methionine to tRNA. And so they made the methionine radioactive, and they incubated tRNA, methionine, and what they thought had uh, Mars, the cell lysate that they thought had Mars activity, they added some uh, ATP, and they measured whether or not radioactive methionine was added to tRNA. So that was their sort of functional assay. And here is the sort of uh, preliminary, res here are the initial results. Here is the mock transfected cell lysate, the wild type transfected cell lysate, and the two, uh, and the two uh, mutations. As you can see, the red is the wild type, and as one adds more tRNA, there's a progressive increase in the amount of methionine that's attached, meaning that there is Mars activity there, whereas in the mock, there is, in the blue, there is very little, and you'll see that there's some, but clearly not very much, Mars activity in either of the two mutations. And she initially quantified this, and there was about 12% of wild-type Mars activity. And now she's gone on to do this several more times. And it appears that each of the mutations has about uh, uh, 15 to 20% uh, of uh, Mars activity. And so uh, we've also uh, aligned um, the human Mars protein sequence with E. coli. And it appears that uh, one of the mutations is located in an alpha helix of the catalytic domain, and the other one is close to an adenylate methionyl binding region. And so there is at least the possibility, based on structure and on these assays, that these two mutations actually disrupt function in this particular, uh, in this particular child. But more importantly, this is the first recognized case of Mars-associated disease, which we thought was initially a congenital disorder of glycosylation. And the advantage, of course, of this is that now we're tr we have, uh, Alina and uh, Stuart, have generated wild-type Mars, 
in each of the mutated Mars's, Mars proteins and are beginning to try to figure out, for example, if you just put more methionine, can you drive more uh, enzyme activity somehow? In other words, can you alter the KM of the uh, enzyme? And so that's, that's underway now. This particular baby is now about two and a half years old. She uh, is developing. Um, she's still pretty hypotonic. Uh, she's no longer uh, transfusion dependent. Her lung disease is much improved. She's no longer on oxygen. Uh, her liver is now working uh, reasonably well. She's in daycare. She does still require total parenteral hyperalimentation for about 85 to 90 percent of her calories, and she gets about 10 percent of her calories enterally. So the, this particular set of uh, parents uh, is um, optimistic, as we are, that we will be able to figure out uh, the exact, um, some strategy to uh, address her Mars uh, mutations. So uh, now this is team Sophie, Isabella, and Evelyn. Um, and this is a completely different phenotype. So this is a problem of very small brain growth, or microcephaly. So this is a completely healthy couple, as the last couple was, with no um, uh, uh, discernible family history of CNS, or central nervous system, problems. And they had three independent conceptions. What that means is that they had a Sophie, who had this problem, and then had a set of twins, and I actually took care of the set of twins. And when Sophie was born and passed away within the first seven days of life, the sort of idea was that, well, this is an accident of nature. But when Isabella and Evelyn came along, it was hard to make this into just an accident of nature. So um, each of the girls uh, had, was small at birth, they had some heart defects, which I'll show you a little bit more about in a second. But the most striking thing about the children was that their brains had stopped growing very, very early in the pregnancy. And the weight of the brains was about a 20th of the weight of a normal uh, baby's brain uh, close uh, to term. Uh, careful neuropathology suggested that there was basically a failure of neuronal precursor proliferation and severe retardation of cortical development, there were some lung defects, and all three of the children died. Now, here, I don't think you need to be a pediatric neuroradiologist to figure out that there's trouble at River City. Uh, on the right is a normal, unrelated individual uh, baby MRI, and on the left, this is, this is actually, I think, Isabella's MRI. So in the normal baby, first of all, you can see the ba baby's brain is bigger. You can see it has these distinct areas. Back here is the cerebellum. You can also see how carefully, intricately folded the baby's brain is. Now, take a look at Isabella. It's completely flat with, you know, basically an arrest of development at the back of the brain, and uh, the brain is uh, extremely small. So we again used exome sequencing. We did mom, dad, and all three girls, okay? So we looked at every uh, variant in all three girls, and Todd selected uh, or chose a somewhat uh, uh, analogous uh, filtering strategy. He basically selected genes, not with who, that necessarily with compound heterozygous, he, he selected genes that had homozygous, uh, loss of function, exonic mutations in all three daughters, and for which the parents were heterozygous. Okay, so that's how he filtered his uh, exome data, and he came up with four genes, okay? But he then surveyed about 4,000 available exomes in a variety of public databases, uh, and you can see them uh, listed there, and he found that the variants that he had found in three of the four genes were common in the population. This phenotype is not common in the population, trust me, not common. Okay, so he reasoned that since those three genes had variants in the girls and in the parents that were common, and since their phenotypes are rare, that those couldn't be the three genes. And so that left him with MKL2 or MRTFB. I'd never heard of it either. So it turns out it has two names because MKL2, megakaryoblastic leukemia, uh, the, the gene was identified because it occurs at a breakpoint, a chromosomal breakpoint in children with uh, megakaryoblastic leukemia. 
And it also has been recognized to be involved, as you'll see in a second, in uh, heart development. Now, there was one, there were one or two little clinkers in Todd's uh, approach here. One was that while the uh, minor allele frequency of this particular variant, this um, uh, 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 HIS-288 GLIN was rare, about 1%, one, 1%. There was, in one of the public databases, an individual who was homozygous for this particular mutation. So, hmm, that's a problem. How can you be homozygous if we're going to say that the baby's phenotype was attributable to a homozygous state, okay? Turns out that was a lady, again, we don't, we're not allowed to know anything about her. We know it's a woman. We know she's about 40, and we know she, we think she had a heart attack. So the second sort of bit of information that sort of emerged was in the uh, Affymetrics array, there was noted to be a 190 kilobase deletion just upstream from the uh, MKL2 MRTFB mutation in the DAD. Okay, so what does MKL2 M MRTFB do? It's basically a transcription factor. It sort of uh, heterodimerizes with a serum response factor, this one at the top here, and it regulates uh, transcription of actin and other cytoskeletal genes, and it also appears to modulate vascular smooth muscle cell phenotype, especially in the heart. Um, it's binding, so in order to be transcriptionally active, it has to bind to SRF, and its binding to SRF is mediated through these two regions down here, okay? And this particular mutation that we found in uh, the, all three girls and heterozygous in the mom and dad is right here at where the uh, SRF uh, binding uh, would occur. However, we could find no prior reports of any humans who had a disease phenotype associated with this gene, much less this mutation. So fortunately, there was some evidence in the literature that uh, this particular um, uh, gene might be responsible for uh, the baby's phenotype. First of all, Eric Olson had uh, done a conditional knockout, reported a conditional knockout in 2010 that was embryonic lethal due to severe uh, brain malformations. We thought that was encouraging. There was another uh, 2010 uh, report of uh, a dominant effect that MKL2 has on control of neuron growth because decreased MKL2 significantly reduces neuron growth. And then Mike Parmacek at the University of Pennsylvania had a uh, null mouse and they died in the perinatal period and uh, were not born at Mendelian ratio. So we had evidence in mice that disruption of the expression of this gene had something to do with brain and heart development. And so this is the way that Todd uh, has put together the information from the literature and uh, what we know about uh, this particular family. Um, it looks as if dad is, has the mutation here in the star and has this deletion. Mom ha and has a normal gene. Mom has the mutation but does not have the deletion and all three girls have the deletion and uh, mutations on both alleles. And the way that we can account for the fact that the 40-year-old woman is still alive and doesn't have microcephaly is because she does not carry the deletion. So it appears that this deletion has something to do with the ability of this gene to work both in the brain and in the heart. So then Mike Parmacek in his lab uh, decided to try to uh, figure out whether uh, we could prove this. He first of all did immunohistochemistry for MKL2 MRTFB in a wild type neonatal heart and in one of the girls neonatal hearts. And what you can see here based on this comparison of the staining is that this particular gene is in fact in expressed in the heart, in the hearts of uh, the uh, affected children but the blood vessels in the children's hearts are clearly large and dilated and abnormal. We don't know why that is, but that's the way it is. And it, exact, it is very similar to uh, Mike Parmacek's uh, cardiac phenotype 
in his, uh, in his uh, uh, mice uh, looked at at uh, embryonic day 18.5. So this appears to suggest that at least in the heart, the cardiac phenotype is similar to the murine phenotype, at least with respect to MKL2 and MRTFB. Now, what about the brain? So unfortunately, Mike had not looked at the brains before, but here what he did was he basically stained again using immunohistochemistry MKL2 and MRTFB in the brain of a child who died of unrelated, the brain of a child, a baby who died of unrelated uh, condition and one of the affected girls. And again, you can see that the gene is expressed in subpopulations of neurons. And so we now think that the phenotype of this particular family is probably due to a combination of reduced expression due to this mutation that both the girls carry and the, and the, and the parents are uh, heterozygous for, and lack of expression uh, on one allele uh, of uh, the, uh, that the girls carry because of some tissue-specific cis-acting binding site in uh, that allele. So this is clearly something that we are still uh, working on. Now, one of the things that you might say is, well, you know, the children are dead. I mean, no therapeutics here, right? Well, not so fast. These family is very interested in trying to figure out where they can have babies and knowing with certainty what the problem is permits pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which I would maintain for some families is almost as important as therapeutics, especially if the phenotype leads is non-viable. So the other thing is, of course, that this particular family, as well as Savannah's family, has, I think, been benefited by the knowledge that there is an answer because parents tend, in my experience, especially mothers, to assume that it must be their fault if there's not an answer. So here's a short summary. We have uh, discovered two novel gene candidate genes associated with rare Mendelian phenotypes. Um, the Exome sequencing with discrete filtering, um, which relies on rare or novel non-synonymous single nucleotide variants, was productive in this particular situation. The stratification of uh, candidate gene variants uh, is, uh, depends upon enrichment for functional and conserved sites. The validation of variants with, in, with an independent sequencing platform is always going to be important. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but next-gen sequencing is terrific, okay? But before you get too far down the uh, biologic feasibility assessment tree, make sure that there's been either dideoxy sequencing or TACMAN or sequinome or some other independent genotyping platform to make sure that it's not a sequencing error in next gen. Next gen is terrific, but they do have some sequencing errors. And finally, it's very important, I think, before you can, so there's a test, there's a validation test to make sure that the variant is real which is an independent sequencing platform, and there's a validation test with respect to biologic plausibility. And both of those tests have to be sort of met uh, in order to be able to have, I think, clinically translatable uh, information for families. So uh, there are a lot of people who sort of participated on the team in, a diff in addition to the people whom I've uh, already cited, but I'd also like to say that, you know, we meet with the families every three or four months and review the progress with the families and review sort of what has happened. And Savannah comes into clinic and we try to monkey with her uh, hyperalimentation fluid to see if we can't figure out a better way to uh, take care of this. So I think that exome sequencing provides, uh, as Eric described this morning, a really potentially transformational strategy is for identifying uh, candidate genes, e novel candidate genes in uh, children especially with rare Mendelian phenotypes. Thank you very much.